Hello, everyone. This presentation on remote sensing component of the workshop will attempt to cover both novice and advanced remote sensing users. My name is Kumar Singh. I'm a geospatial scientist in a data at William & Mary. I use geospatial data and methods to study land use changes and assess the effects of developmental intervention on land change. My research focuses on land and vegetation dynamics and their impact on natural resources. This graphic tells a story about how a landscape can be changed if resources are engineered. A few things are obvious and others needing discoveries. For example, the enormity of land change over time, the consumption of natural resources such as water to sustain such enormous farming far from water resources. An obvious question is that, uh, is this land uh, conversion phenomena? What is this land con uh, conversion phenomena and where is this land is located? So this is a time series NDVI of farm, farmlands located in Wadi Basin, Saudi Arabia. This time series NDVI was developed using satellite remote sensing. So what is remote sensing? So remote sensing is a science of gathering information about a location from a distance. For example, sensors on satellite records reflected energy from the Earth's surface in the form of energy with rows of pixels or grids. To simplify these examples, if you hold a camera and take photos of object, that is remote sensing. You are a platform, the camera in your hand is a sensor, and the photo that you took is a remote sensing data. The image you see on the right side in the basic is the basic schematic of remote sensing. There is an energy source that is sun, both, uh, both space and airborne platforms, and the earth surface. The energy emitted by the sun hits the earth surface and reflected energy after all kinds of atmospheric interfer interference are usually captured by sensors that are transmitted back to the earth data storage system and later shared by various means to users. We users are typically interested in different types of data collected by various sensors, which are defined by portions of electromagnetic spectrum. The second graphic you see, for example, a camera that we use in our day-to-day -day life captures only RGB, means red, green, blue portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Sensors that captures RGB, infrared, thermal infrared, and many other portions of electromagnetic magnetic spectrums are known as multispectral sensors. For example, Landsat. Images, images, images collected from Landsat sensor. Other examples are LiDAR sensor, means light detection and ranging sensor. Sensors designed to collect SAR data, means synthetic, uh, synthetic aperture radar data. All these sensors capture different portions of electromagnetic spectrum. Data from these sensors have different uses. To understand the land and vegetation dynamics and their impact on natural resources, we typically rely on sensors that collect multi-spectral imageries for various reasons. One of them is types of resolution. There are four types of resolutions, a spatial, spectral, radiometric, and temporal. A spatial re re resolution refers to the size of the smallest feature that can be detected by a satellite sensors or displayed in satellite imagery. A spectral resolution refers to the ability of sensor to measure a specific wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Radiometric resolution refers to the number of possible data files in each band, for example, 2-bit, 8-bit, and 16-bit. Temporal, uh, temporal resolution refers to the time between images. We have to pick one over another resolution. If you decide on imagery with high spatial resolution, for example, planetoscope, you will have to sacrifice a spectral, a spectral resolution. Sensors that collect images in high spatial resolution will typically have lower spectral, means fewer bands, and low temporal means fewer frequent revisits resolution. 
On the other hand, sensor with a high temporal resolution will typically have lower spatial and spectral resolution than sensors that collect data in a low, in a low uh, temporal resolution. There are hundreds of sensors by uh, various space agencies, for example, Landsat by NASA and USGS, Cartoset by Indian Space Research Organization, Sentinel by European Space Agency. The figure on the right shows the list of satellite sensors and their spatial resolution from 1972 to very recent. The upper right graphic shows the history of Landsat sensors that started in, in the 1970s. Currently, we have Landsat 9, which was launched in 2021. If any of us want to study historical perspective of land change, any part of the world, we have to pick a sensor that has the longest coverage. In that case, Landsat is an ideal sensor, which provides imagery as, as back as from 1972 onwards. Now we know about a little bit about remote sensing, different, different types of sensors and types of resolution. Land change studies are among many uses of uh, satellite imagery. Land change is how does one type of land cover change, uh, change into other land use types over time, for example, Forest stands are converted into farmland that over time are converted into developed uses and later in few cases are restored to improve ecological integrity of a system. For the most recent, there have been some effort in cranberry farming where retired farms are restored to improve the ecological functioning in the northeast uh, part of the northeastern part of the United States. On the left, what you see is the very basic land use and land cover mapping workflow. First user decides type of imagery, for example, Landsat, and then they do pro processes. Uh, then they do pre-processing that includes radiometric and geometric corrections. There are many more activities, but radiometric and geometric corrections are essential ones. Radiometric means if you're heavy using two images, aligning their uh, spectral values, normalizing their spectral values, removing the color differences. Geometric corrections are like uh, matching uh, coordinates of each pixel to the ground. Then user decides classification scheme, classification algorithm, and go in the field to collect, uh, collect ground observations. In classification schemes, there are some standard, standardized classification schemes are available. Few we can customize based on our needs. In classification algorithm, there's a long list of algorithms are available. We can pick based on our needs. In ground observations, uh, until very recently, we used to collect, in, uh, we used to rely exclusively on in situ observation, means go. Uh, in the field with the GPS and identify types of land use land cover types and all the aspects. But now we can also use high resolution satellite images to compensate at some, to, to some extent. Once we have all, all these, we plug in together and we do land use land cover map, map, we create land use land cover maps. Later, we perform accuracy assessment to understand how accurate our products are. Any land use land cover product which has accuracy above 85 are considered useful and are used for any further analysis. On the right hand side table basically provides examples of this workflow. For example, if you read this table by row, let's say third row specific, uh, specifically, Researchers have utilized decision trees to create a series of maps, single date, multi-date maps using Landsat and AVHRR imagery. To do the mapping, satellite imageries 
satellite images was used to create various products such as vegetation in, in indices. And then these derived products were processed using decision tree algorithm for mapping. And the final step was accuracy assessment. Now, if you read this table by column, that basically says, pick algorithms by your comfort, pick data, means satellite imagery by your need, and create variables that you think are useful or could be useful to capture some of those landscape aspects that you wish, wish to map or quantify. The hardest part in mapping process is the selection of algorithms, classification algorithms. There's a long list from very simple to very complex. Some of the simples are like a simple classification algorithm. The algorithms are like unsupervised classification. And uh, another one is like maximum likelihood. But other advanced are neural networks, random forest, uh, gradient boosting, and many more. So user, so in order to understand, uh, user must know how to select algorithms. Uh, how a selected algorithm works. User must know how to interpret outcomes. We, we must know what parameters should be tweaked to make improvements. And we must, must know the strength and weakness. For example, in this case, random forest. Random forest is ideal for, uh, uh, for various reasons. One of them is very uh, unique and that is it determines variable importance. I mean, it tells that which variable contributes the most to the mapping or uh, quantifying land use land cover types. It also is unique in the sense it bypasses multicollinearity issues. It also easily, it can handle easily multidimensionality means a long array of variables. Yeah. But there are also few weaknesses like decision rules are usually unknown. It, it's computationally intense if we are doing on a desktop. And it needs some, we tweak, uh, need some input parameters like trees and variable variables per nodes. Means some, some we need to know how to handle these. So that is the case of when we have to map any land use land cover type. This is one example that we recently use in one of the, um, uh, we created for one of the project where uh, we used Landsat imagery at five year interval from, two, uh, from 2000 un until 2020. And uh, we used random forest to map uh, seven different types of class, uh, different class types from uh, uh, 1995, 2010, 15, and 20. There were some field observations we had, and then we also collected using some high resolution satellite, uh, satellite imagery for that same year, the one we were mapping, for example, for 2000, we had some observation already and then we collected more using same year high resolution satellite imagery. And we also performed accuracy for each land use land cover maps. And accuracy always changed and varied and there were multiple regions, one variability in the landscape, if you see Satellite image on the left hand side, you will see the huge variability. There are uh, there are hills, mountains, uh, mountain covers covered with the uh, snow, and then on the north, some grassland, and south some uh, flat area nearby Kabul. So there were like a huge variability in a landscape, and that can sometimes challenge and uh, can cause uh, impact overall performance of land use land cover accuracies. So there are various uh, and, uh, knowledge, uh, landscape knowledge and uh, classification schemes, algorithms that go into to create an uh, 
a product that is very efficient or useful for the further analysis uh, input to geospatial impact evaluation. Satellite imagery is, is to process for various product. You already have learned about land use land cover mapping. Other examples are estimating evapotranspiration transpiration rate of vegetation types, emphasizing certain properties of land, land, landscape, such as soil, moisture, water availability, and most importantly, derive soil, fire, and vegetation indices, such as NDVI and NDWI. So Landsat, there are algorithm that uh, you can use to estimate evapotranspiration for any landscape uh, for for any areas to understand the water uses of one vegetation compared to other and we can the same way we can also estimate variety of vegetation indices that can help us to know the productivity of vegetation type for example and dvi NDBI is an amazing process product, a processing product. It can be, it can distinguish between healthy crop and crops with a disease. Healthy, uh, healthy plants reflect more in, uh, in the uh, reflect more the near infrared light and very little on the red light. While brown plants reflect more red light and less infra infrared light. You can create NDVI by, by taking their ratios. A low NDVI value indicates the plant is ready to be harvested. Uh, has some issues, uh, or some kind of means it, it is it bears some kind of a stress. While a high NDVI value indicates the plant is green. For example, the NDVI value of 0 0.2, a lower indicates crop is ready for harvest which are uniform yellow to brown color during harvest. On the other hand, NDVI value of zero to five or higher indicates a green plant. Using the NDVI imaging system, we, we, will, uh, we will then be able to effect, effectively map the problem areas of weed within a large grain field. This figure is a time series NDVI. The figure you see on the uh, lower right corner is basically time series NDVI of forest, water, farm, and grass. The NDVI value of water bodies, they are below zero. There are a few points, they are above zero, and they are basically there because there are, uh, there are some algal bloom in that area, that particular period of time, and that showed some NDVI value. And the NDVI value of forest, farm, and grassland, they are always in a certain pattern. If there is a mature forest, it will, it will uh, show you a, uh, a, a, a peak. It will have a greening, uh, green, green, uh, greening up period, then maturity, then senescence, and dormancy. It follows throughout years. While in, in farmland, when a crop is sown, that is the point when NDVI, we can detect after when there is a green. And at one point it matures and we harvest. And after that, there is uh, NDVI, very low NDVI, NDVI because of some grass or some other weeds. And those are the ways we can uh, distinguish forest from grass and from farmland. Whenever we create NDVI, we always have to be aware of the landscape, what we are studying. We should know that what, what, are, uh, what, what, are, what types of vegetations are there. For example, a vegetation a, during the dormant phase or during the fall period, and a vegetation that has some kind of a stress like disease infestation and a gr uh, grass which is um, is about to uh, because the fall is drying up this this uh, shows same range of ndvi values 
to understand whether this is a mature crop ready to be harvested or crop infested with the pests and pathogens. We need to have some ground observation to, to make a clear distinction between these, uh, the, the, these uh, different uh, types of crops are uh, between uh, different vegetation types. To create these times as vegetation indices, there are a few ways we can do. One is we can download time series satellite images on a desktop. We can create NDVI for each time step, and then we can stack them. And then either using point location or polygon, we can extract those NDVI value for the analysis. Second option is just use online environments such as, such as a Google Earth Engine, where you have all the data, uh, satellite imagery, variety of satellite imagery available. Just we have to add a shape file, which either has a point or polygon to extract time series NDVI value. Then that time series NDVI value can, can vary from, uh, means uh, from monthly to annual basis. Uh, for each uh, imagery available between that time period that user picks are we, we want to study. Whenever we are analyzing NDVI, there should be, we should be very careful with one regard. If we are using multiple since uh, multiple satellite imagery types, we should ensure that they are not normalized. For example, NDVI created by Landsat and NDVI data created by uh, created using Sentinel, they should be normalized before they are used together in any studies because they are different. Their characteristics, characteristics are different because they are from different sensors. Their setups are totally different. So in order to use NDVI from two different sources, we should ensure that they are normalized. And there are various methods available that can be used to normalize the, uh, NDVI data from two or many other sensors. And with this, I think this is the last for uh, last presentation, uh, last slide for this this portion. I'll take a pause, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And after a little break, I'll start start the next uh, portion of the presentation.